Hey, how's it going? This is a... Basically, you could consider it a Google interview question because it was posed by Anthony D. Mays. And I just wanted to give my take on it. I'm going to use JavaScript. Just be warned ahead of time, ahead of time that I lean heavily towards JavaScript ES3. Um, that being said, I'm not afraid to trickle in newer stuff from newer JavaScript, but I use like the ver keyword and stuff like that, and that's my own personal preference. Anyway, so the question is find indices M, N, such that if I sorted elements of the array from M to N, the whole array would be sorted. And the two examples he gave were these two right here. Um, I've added a console log and I'm going to put them in a function called get range up here. And then I added these other little test cases down here as just some, um, uh, I think a good thing to do, especially in real world, is to test for like the empty case, the case of one, cases of two, things like that, you know, flipped, whatever. I think you get the idea. So that's what's going on there. But these specifically were, of course, the two that he used. And I'll try to remember to put a link to his original video in there as well. So basically, if you're going through here, if we take this first one as an example, it's one, two, three, four, four seven, ten, eleven. It's all sorted ascending order up through there. And then all of a sudden it gets out of order right here, seven, da 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 da. And then 16, 18, 19, it's back into order. So basically, in this example, that little portion right there is, well, I, that portion's obviously out of order. And then if you consider the six in there and all that, then that means that we need to sort this whole sub range right here. And that would leave the rest of the array sorted. And then the second example, obviously, it's in the complete reverse order. So the entire array item 0 through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, excuse me, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 would need to be sorted. So these are the, the expected results here is that, uh, you know, starting at 0, 1, 2, 3. Right there, we'll need to sort all the way through four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so that would be correct. All right, so I'm, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start getting started. And the best thing I think to do in a technical interview scenario is to consider what's the easiest thing that could, and in real world too, is consider what's the easiest thing that could possibly work. Don't necessarily worry so much about the uh, resource complexity on it, but you should, in a technical interview for sure, discuss that and see if you can get away with just doing a quick implementation. In the, especially like the over the phone kind of technical interview, Google Doc style technical interviews, they're probably going to want to try and get at least two questions across. And the first one's probably going to be a lot easier than the second one. So if you can just knock the first one out quickly, they would probably prefer that. But that being said, they'll probably ask you at least a couple questions around it and stuff like that. So anyway, I guess all that's to say that like just try and use a little bit of psychology if you can get away with it or just, you know, use your wit to try and be able to start implementing that ultra simple, short, sweet, quick solution, even if it scales horribly, you know? And so that's what I'm gonna give you right now is that example of that solution, which would be, what if we just made a copy of this array and then compared it to its copy? And then we know, uh, excuse me, make a copy, sorted copy, and then um, compare this unsorted one to that and then we'll we'll realize once we get here on the sorted one in the comparison to this third element it will be not equal to a six you know the six will be here and then on the unsorted one of course it will still be the seven so the six and seven will trigger uh you know an unequal comparison and then we can know that at that point the index value would be zero one two three 
and then at that three it would trigger that comparison we could eject from that loop and then we could start working backwards and go uh what is this one so we know this is 9 10 11 12 so we'd start at the length of the array basically one less than the length come in and go uh you know compare this and these three what should compare and then right here on this ninth element we should trigger the false value the non-equal and uh then we'll have our end value and then from there we can pretty much return the results we'd of course need to check them for scenarios like down here um and these are the kind of scenarios to be wary of when you just see these top two lines as the potential inputs they're probably going to pull especially maybe on the second question but very likely on the first one too they're going to pull this stuff out of the hat and ask you you know what would you do in these types of scenarios and all that so that's one of the reasons i've included those so anyway i'll go ahead and start implementing it and what i'm going to do is create a variable and since i'm passing these this uh, list, if you want to call it that, in as inputs right here. I itch my ear. So I'm passing that in as inputs. So we'll call the sorted one, we'll call it inputs sorted. And that will take, we'll do inputs. And then in JavaScript, you can do a slice and that will give a copy of the array. Otherwise, we won't end up with a copy like we expect. It will do an in place sort and then I can go ahead and chain on the sort method onto that and in JavaScript by default one little gotcha if you're not familiar with the language is it will sort alphabetically even numbers it will convert numbers to strings and sort those alphabetically so it would turn this into 1 10 11 uh, 12 it would sort it like that if I have my alphabeticalness correct on that so what we can do though is we can pass it a comparison function and since I like to lean towards JavaScript ES3 I would just pass it a function like this and say and it will take two parameters is the expectation there and then I'll return a minus B and what this does is it will send in for the first round it will send in one and two and then it will subtract one and two and we'll end up with a negative one and if this comparison function gets negative then it it knows that this number goes be the a number goes before the b number and so on and that will continue all the way until we get to that deal right there and then that will return um 11 minus 7 that will be a positive three so it will know that a goes afterwards and then you might be wondering what happens if it's zero and they're the same number like if there were two sevens next to each other for example will that be stable will the, and it, by stable that means whether or not it will actually flip the two numbers even though potentially even though they're the same exact number or if it will leave them in the right relative order and all that the answer is it depends um older browsers and JavaScript engines are likely to have an unstable sort and very new JavaScript engines are likely to have a stable sort. V8 I think does it differently or did do it differently I don't know it's something that can vary so don't have too high of an expectation either way I think it's um, ES script 2019 is supposed to guarantee a stable sort but to what degree browsers have implemented that here in early 2021, who knows? So anyway, and I don't think uh, most people probably, if you just said what I said during an interview, then they would be happy that you're at least that knowledgeable about it, you know, maybe give you a good mark or whatever. I don't think they'd expect you to know, uh, you know, two dozen different browser versions and exactly whatever. But if you did, that'd probably be good too but I wouldn't trip out on that too much. Okay, so there's that. And you know what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go ahead and refactor this back to, even though I despise ES6, the one good thing, and the fat arrow functions especially, this is one situation where a fat arrow actually makes sense, a fat arrow expression. 
because that's the way it should be. If it should be a lambda like that, it shouldn't even have those curly braces. So this is like one of those few ideal situations where the fat arrow actually makes sense. Other than that, I never ever use arrow functions. And even then, even to this day, I'd be slightly hesitant because who knows, you got to take into consideration what your audience or whatever you want to call them, what the, the likely engine that the lowest common denominator that your software might be ran on. So it may be better to just go ahead and use the function keyword and all that. Okay. And now that we have that, so we have a copy of a sorted array and input sorted. So what we can do is we can just use a regular old for loop. I'm not going to use the for each or anything crazy like that. This one's easy to break out of and just I not the biggest fan of like map and reduce and all that kind of stuff anyway, but those are always options too. So I'm going to do this and we're going to look for the the M first. So var M we're going to start at the beginning and I will run that until M as long as M is less than the inputs dot length and we'll go ahead and increment M and so while M is less than the inputs dot length starting at the beginning of the array we're going to iterate through it and say if inputs M at the index M is not equal to um, input set is not equal to inputs sorted M then we're gonna break and the reason some people kind of frown on this of pitting the if statement all on one line I say suck it. No, I'm just kidding. What I do is I say, if it's just a simple statement, then I'll go ahead and do it on one line. It, so if it was just a simple variable assignment or it's this simple break, stuff like that, or maybe just a function call, I'll go ahead and put it on that line. Because with JavaScript, you uh, it will do the automatic semicolon insertion if I don't use the curly braces. And so to prevent that risk, I you know, instead of doing something like this. So that could potentially have an automatic semicolon insertion. So I keep it on one line to prevent that. And then I avoid doing this whole, uh, this whole crufty scenario right here where I do that and then that, and it's just, that's just way too much in my opinion. So that's just to kind of explain my reasoning behind that. And that's the way I roll. So that's that. And as you can see with this for statement, I could have technically put the if statement up here and just had one long thing. That's getting carried away. You know, that this if is not a simple statement to me. So, you know, a statement where you would be tempted to use curlies, I don't consider that a simple. So I went ahead and brought it down, put it in the curlies. I, it's just, it's all about readability and simplicity, keeping it as simple and readable as possible, especially out of the gate. And uh, so then once we do that, if we just, kind of do a quick pause and run through right here you know we're going to iterate through the whole thing if inputs n which will be one at first is not equal to the sorted version then we're going to break and of course it should be equal to the sorted version all the way until it gets right here because this six should be in this zero one two three space index um, so six and seven will clash and that will leave m with a value of three I would say definitely stop too if you're, you know, actually taking my advice for even though I have failed the Google interview before, but what for me it helps to think out loud and it's going to help you, I would think for most people and then you can also as you explain it to your interviewer, that's going to make them happy. They're probably going to give you points for that and then you know, you're helping them too. That's lowering their frustration factor and increasing their comfort with you, so that's usually a good thing, I think. Okay, and then n, and this time we're going to start at the end of the array, of course, so it's going to be inputs.length, and we're going to 
go through that as long as n's greater than zero. So if n gets all the way back to what would be this um, first element right here, we're just gonna go ahead and bail then. And then we're gonna decrement m. A lot like the inverse of the first thing here. So if inputs n is not equal to the sorted variant. Just if you do copy yourself, make sure not to copy the m and the n in that type of a situation. Then we're gonna break. And we'll put our little closing bracket down here. And quick pause on that and see where we're at. So of course we're gonna step through var n inputs length backwards. One thing I forgot is to length minus one. Right here it works because um, we're doing less than. So when we're on the last element, the length is technically one passed because of the zero based indexing, right? And the length is one based. So right here, this will start us correctly. Otherwise that first one will be undefined, I believe in JavaScript. So n is, and we'll continue through it while n is above this element and working backwards. So if inputs n, which would be 19 the first round, is not equal to input sorted n, then break. So that should all be good till we get there to the 12, 11, 10, 9 spot, which is right here we can see is what we're looking for. So that's all good. So then we come down here and we're going to return m and n, right? So I'll go ahead and just for illustrative purposes, since I am in an IDE, I definitely suggest, you know, maybe the so you get comfortable solving these types of problems, just do that, do them in a uh, syntax editor and all that. But then once you're really prepping right before, you know, so many days before you go to do the, uh, the actual interview, you'll want to compose this in a, you know, a plain Google Docs editor or even just plain notepad and then copy and paste it into, or, uh, you know, if you're doing notepad instead of Google Docs, you can just probably save the file and compile it or run it or whatever, but do whatever you gotta do to effectively copy and paste it into your compiling environment and run it or whatever. I'm using the Grail VM JS compiler. It's a very nice JavaScript runtime and it also includes a copy of Node, the latest LTS version of Node.js as well. So it's kind of like if you think of like a, a synchronous version of Node almost without all the libraries and stuff like that. It's And it's very ECMAScript compliant as well. So anyway, if we run this, put a semicolon there, we can see that we have the 3.9 like we expect. And let me scroll this down here so we can see all of our test fodder. We have the 3.9, we have the 0 0.5, then we've, the only other one we have right here is the 0 0.1 which is, that's good, that's what we want there. But if you look at these other ones, they're kind of funky, like two zero, you know, that, that those aren't right. And so looking at the consistencies of this here, we can see that uh, M is greater than N. And so we have a problem in that scenario there. So what we can do is say, if M is less than N, using an inline condition, then uh, return that, otherwise return a null. And that would be a little cleaner. So we'll run that and then there we can see we get the ones we expect and with the proper ascending subrange index values with a happy, nice little clear to understand null otherwise. Okay, so now looking at the runtime complexity of this, we can see that we're copying the entire array right here with input slice. So that gives us uh, O of one, excuse me, O of N linear memory because we're using an extra line of memory, right? We're using, you know, so O of one would be constant memory. That means that like these very, these little variables don't matter because no matter how big our input is, we're only going to use two of these little automatic local variables, whatever you want to think of them as. But this right here, 
this auxiliary space is going to grow based on the input size. So that's whenever you're thinking about complexities, usually worst case based on growth, you know? So if you have trouble thinking about, uh, and I'm not a complexity expert by any means or anything, but this is just my little basic layman's style explanation. So that's kind of, I don't know, that's not really ideal, but whatever. And then we've got our sort going on here and it might seem like, you know, this is easy to just gloss over and be like, oh, you know, there it was one little, one little action or something, but there, there's several actions going on there. You know, there's that slice, it's copying the array and then it's sorting that copy and we know the sort is going to be super linear. So it's going to be at least, I mean, most likely the sort that's going to get used is going to be like n log n, right? Or maybe like some type of a radix sort and radix sort and that would be like n plus k if I have that right or n times k. I don't remember. Look it up for yourself, of course. But anyway, that you could just generically refer to that as super linear which means it's going to take at least a little bit more than linear time. So at least it's going to take a little bit more than one pass through to sort it. So right there, we're off to a shaky start. <laughs> Those are two things that we kind of like to eliminate. And then of course, right here, uh, worst case, we're going to go through the whole array. If we have an already sorted array, you know, it seems like, oh, best case right here, big deal. You know, it's like, it's sort of like a logarithmic runtime, right? But we can't go by that best or leaning best average case or whatever it probably got to consider worst case it's good to be able to talk about average cases too if you know uh, you know know your complexities well and everything and then right here we got worst case we got to go back through the whole array again so what we have is basically 3n here because you know this is super linear so that's at least n or at least a little over n right and then we got 2n, then we've got 3n. Well, the good thing is, of course, is that you get rid of those, uh, uh, the word's escaping me right now, but the uh, the insignificant constants, you, you just keep your, your, uh, your biggest constant, right? So, or you dump off all those constants. So you end up, that 3n, you drop the 3, and then it, um, you end up with just n. So it's still linear is what it comes down to. It's growth because that's what you're talking about is how is it going to grow? You know, if we give it twice as big of an array, is it going to take 10 times longer to run? And that's not the case with this necessarily. It's going to take, um, you know, it's going to grow linearly like a, a line going at an angle that isn't too too crazy. Linear, I don't think is... You're not too bad at linear. That's that's pretty lean and ideal. So anyway, can we do better? And the answer is, of course, yes. But the cool thing about this is it was quick and simple and everything. And that way you knock something out. You've got like you've got paint on the canvas for your interviewer and stuff, and you show that you know how to knock it out. And this kind of will help you to to wrap your head around the problem more because you can just sort of like kick it around, you know, and then you get like how I've just been talking about it and everything. I'm more comfortable with what's going on here. So I'm going to get rid of all this, zero it out here, and we're going to try something different. So if we think about it, as we go through here, when we get to, uh, we don't know, like as long as we're going up in value, we're ascending. And that's something too, definitely, I glazed over it because, or glossed over it because um, I'm, you know, don't have an interviewer in front of me and everything. So I'm not really thinking like, can I ask questions about it? Plus I practiced this once before I hit record. So I'm probably uh, taking advantage of that fact in my mind and everything. I'm not quite thinking it out as much because if I do that, I take forever and I like, it's bad. But anyway, um, yeah, if we notice we're ascending, right? And then once we're not ascending, that's when we have a problem. Like, I wouldn't, maybe not a problem, but that's when it's time to start taking note of stuff, right? So as soon as we descend, then we realize, okay, yeah, this is definitely out of order and everything. And 
we know we're in some some window that first little window when I highlighted and I said you know there's where we know we have a problem and then considering the lowest value in there we know that it's gonna go back over there so it's kind of trying to tap into the common sense on that and so my first instinct would be to think like okay well the previous value if I'm less than the previous value that I'm descending and then if my if I'm greater than the previous value then I'm ascending and that seems to work until in this nice example fodder you get here and realize hey wait a minute I'm ascending but it's still out of order you know because trying to realize when we hit this scenario here and we know we're good right that because this is ascend 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 that's good but here we have an ascend but we need to grab this seven too we don't want to leave that out so thinking about it once more over again if we think as long as as long as we're ascending beyond the maximum value we've seen so far so as long as you know one as long as it's greater than one two is greater than one four is greater than two you know that idea so if you know where I'm going with that obviously we need to track a max instead of instead of a previous so it's like a previous maximum is what we're keeping track of so in that case we'd end up at 12 and then once we get to six we realize hey six is less than our previous maximum so we know it's out of whack so that still works and then seven is less than our previous maximum so it's out of whack so that works and that will help us to uh, get this full range here but effectively we don't have the full range yet right we just based on what I said we just know about that right there okay and then what we can do is we can effectively drag this six back over here in front of the seven that's the next thing we need to do and so that will give us the only way that I know to do that is you know we go through this whole thing we have to at least go through it once so we're not going to beat linear because we got it who knows what if there's a seven right there at the end of this or something you know we got to make sure about that and then what are we going to do to track where the six goes when we find it are we going to create a whole another array and track the six and like oh okay no that's just wasting space we already have our array so the best thing I could think of is go back to uh, the beginning of the array and just take you know we've kept this six it will be our minimum value within that range once we realize we're out of whack we'll keep track we've already been keeping track of a max the whole time right but we'll start keeping track of a minimum also once we get right in here so that we can see what the minimum value is and then we can take that minimum and start at the beginning and drag it along and then we go oh there's where it goes so that's what we'll do to figure that out and then as we go along and we're comparing these values to that max like I said before we'll we'll realize when we get to the seven it's less than the max which is 12 so far and then all these other ones are going to be greater than the max so this will leave that effective n value at seven and then six when we iterate through sort of logarithmically we'll come back to uh zero one two three and there it will it should go okay so all that being said I'm going to do a for each loop on inputs since like I said I'm not scared to maybe touch some ES5 right here and I know I'm going to go through this I need to iterate through this whole I need to do a whole linear iteration through it so I'm I don't need an easy way to abort that for loop so this seems pretty ideal right here so for each that's going to take a function and we that function it's going to pass the value that item value to and we'll go ahead and close that off okay so it's not too important about which order we a lot of this part goes in right here but 
it's just whatever your mind in this kind of a situation whatever works most comfortable to you you can go back and refactor it really quick if you're good at that uh, they seem to usually frown on like any sort of heavy refactoring it's almost like you just got to do it don't ask permission ask forgiveness kind of thing when you go to do it um because it's all about just you know give them their indicators that they need to go know and move on right do it as good as possible so with that value we can test if this value is greater if the current value is greater than the max that we're at and before I do anything it's like I realize I needed a max right there this is how I personally prefer to do variables is I just start coding out I don't stop and think like oh I'm gonna need all these variables just do it and just use what you need it's that keep it short and simple kiss principle and Yagni you ain't gonna need it those are probably your two most important principles in this scenario right here so I'm gonna go ahead and do ver max and since it's a maximum I want to start the minimum as low as I want to start it as low as possible so that you know that one triggers it right so in JavaScript I can go ahead and use a negative infinity if I spell it right and then even one will trigger and one will be greater than maximum so in that case we'll set max equal to the current value that we're on and so as long as value is greater than max the current value is greater than the current maximum then we'll assign it to the maximum and that means we're ascending so that's the ascending condition the ascending scenario and if you want comment it don't be afraid to do that I don't know if I spelled ascending right but anyway that that helps everybody okay and then otherwise if the value and I'm not going to just do an else because uh, we want to make sure otherwise that the value is less than max because if the values exactly equal to the max then we're just not going to do anything so value is less than max then it's gonna get compound right here and so if the value is less than max then we're going to be dragging along that n value is what we need to do so as soon as this goes down right here we know that n's going to be at least right here right this is we're going to have to go at least through there with n and then every time we hit one of those scenarios where we're less than max we know we need to set n to it so First thing I'll go ahead and do is set n and make a variable n. And we'll set n equal to the index of the current thing, the current value. So I don't have an index variable yet, right? But I know that if I come, because this is just giving me by value, but if you're familiar with the JavaScript uh, array for each function, then you know that you can assign that by giving it a parameter to assign to assign it to right there so we'll do that that covers that and then what we want to check while we're in here while we're in this descending scenario descending um, I think I spelt that wrong descending I don't know okay so while we're descending then um, if it's descending so like right here we've set n to that and then we want to track that minimum value like I was saying because we're trying to find out within this range of oh my mouse is giving out on me one second here oh come on <laughs> I'll just use my trackpad if I have to. Okay, so while we're descending here, um, we want to track that what our lowest our lowest value in here is going to be, right? Because if the seven, we're obviously going to end up with the six. So within this window of uh, tracking this n here, as we're dragging that along, so to speak, we want to see at the same time 
if the value is less than a current minimum. So we'll come up here and add ver minimum. And then we'll set this one to positive infinity for the opposite reason that we set the other one to negative infinity. So that no matter what, on the first comparison on the seven, then it will be less than positive infinity. So that will automatically assign seven to it. And then of course, when it gets to that six, that will evaluate to less as well. So then it gets value. And that should work there. Okay, and if you're like me, I was just pausing to think about if it should work. If you're going to pause for more than a second or two, talk about what you're doing. Just say you're thinking or whatever, stuff like that, right? And also, if you look up and it's kind of foggy, like, okay, did I do it right? Eyes glaze over kind of thing stop and just go over it they might even ask you to they probably will beat you to that but otherwise you know go ahead and do that or ask permission some people like you know do you mind if i uh go over it real quick or whatever so anyway what we're going to do is we're going to drop into this function with it as inputs we've got our variables then we're going to say for each we're going to uh get a value and an index for each item and then if that value is greater than the maximum, the maximum gets that value, and that means we're ascending. And to ask if we're descending, we're going to say if otherwise, if the value is less than the maximum, the current maximum so far, then we're descending. One thing, too, you could actually be wordier and pit like current max. That's kind of the way that I usually do stuff. But I've been trying to, like, be a little more terse and everything. And some people get weird with longer words and longer words does look like more text on the screen and stuff so use your best judgment on that um so if we are descending then that means we need to drag this uh end value out because that's no good that's stuff that needs to be sorted if we're descending off of that that current maximum seen so far value and if our value is less than minimum while we're descending if that current value happens to be less than the smallest one we've seen so far in our wacky little unsorted area, then go ahead and store that in our min. Okay. And then once we get out of there, we will have the index, this index, and we'll have this value, but we won't have this index right here that that six goes at. So we need to effectively start over and drag that six through so we'll do that and this time i'm going to use oh, sorry not an if loop but a for loop and i'm using this style of for loop because it's easy to eject from once we find the answer we can just bounce out and shoot that answer straight back so i'll do four and then i'm need an m variable here so i'll add that up top there and we'll set m at zero start at the beginning of that list and while m is less than the length of that list we will increment it and uh so if inputs at the index of M is so as we come through here this index is going to be smaller than M or excuse me min smaller than min smaller than min smaller than min max or excuse me greater than min right there so we want to find out if that index is greater than the minimum value naming can be key there too don't get yourself caught in a tongue pickle mind pickle with that to where you don't do the you know do the wrong stuff or whatever okay then we want to bust out of that loop if that's the case and if we bust out of that loop like that then we should effectively be uh go ahead and pause and reiterate right here we're starting at the beginning of the loop there and while the 
you know, we're going to go through the whole loop. Potentially, I'm using a for loop, not a while loop, because, hey, what if this is already uh, in a situation where it might just run past the end of it or whatever, right? And uh, we want to control that so that, you know, there there's a terminating case there. I think, right? Is that no matter what we should end up with uh, because the min the min value might not ever get propagated in some cases, right? The min value. Like if it's already in order, then there would be no min value in that range because it would never be less than the max. So like in this scenario right here, Okay, so that's why we want to make sure we have a, a termination style case. So you could do a while loop, it would just be more long-winded to write out, and this is kind of the purpose of the for loop, right? Okay, so anyway, if, uh, if that input at that index is greater than that minimum value, then abort, so that would be 0, 1, 2, 3, and that's what we're looking for right there is that 3, so that's good. And then just like before, we can do a return. Should be the same type of a scenario where if n is less than n, then uh, go ahead and return m comma n. And otherwise, we'll just give them a nice clean null. And let's, oh, you know what I accidentally did here? I'm glad I caught that. I was stuck in the, for each loop which should have ended right here okay now I believe this should work all right we got a three nine three nine do we have a zero five we got a zero five we got a null null because this one's totally empty case we're covering for this one's a case of one and then after those two cases we have a zero comma one because it's out of order starting at index zero and it's all the way through index one and then this last one it's already in order so that's a null and there you have it that's the way you do that thanks a lot for watching